Well, howdy. That's as, as Texas as I can do. Uh, day two of Shot Show 2019. I am going to do my uh, little bit of a video wrap up. Uh, we're waiting for people to join, so I'm just going to blankly stare at the camera for a couple of minutes. In the meantime, today was sort of an interesting uh, day. We visited comparatively fewer uh, booths than yesterday, but spent a lot more time in each uh, in each one booth, which was uh, which was kind of interesting. Uh, pretty productive day. Learned about a ton of new and interesting stuff. I visited Steiner Burris, MTC, Hawk Athlon, March, Sensite, interesting new company, uh, Kestrel, uh, Vortex. Uh, Bishop, uh, some really odd companies, ran at the guys from, uh, what's it called, uh, what was it, Frontier Optics Research, or what was it, Field Optics Research, a really interesting uh, company, uh, ran into world champion field target shooter, whose name is always, I can't remember, although I spent a solid 40 minutes speaking her brain, what's her name? You took a photo of it, I don't know. I did. It's on that phone that's recording Facebook Live. <laughs> Anyhow, I will fill that in later. She was uh, extremely pleasant and very, very knowledgeable. So the she shoots with a Daystate um, air gun. 2018 Ladies uh, World Champion, which was very, uh, uh, very impressive. And uh, what else? I think that's roughly the thing. Oh, they talked to me, Opta, long talk with me, Opta. Um, a, few, a few things sort of stood out. First of all, I think I should probably mention there is one company uh, we visited yesterday that I did not get a chance to talk about for a fundamentally important reason uh, I forgot. Uh, Maprolite, Israeli company. Um, there are quite a few Israeli companies here, most of them doing some reasonably innovative things. A lot of them doing some version of with a digital rifle scope, augmented reality rifle scope. And these, um, one of the sort of overarching themes of what I'm seeing at the SHOT Show this year is the push toward digital. I haven't visited all of them, right? I'm way behind schedule. There's a lot more to see. A lot of people are trying to do either fully digital rifle scope uh, binocular or a some sort of a fuse thing either fusing multiple channels together we'll talk more about that later or uh, seeing a live image with an a big one and adding additional uh, information to it basically projecting a screen and that is what Maprolite is doing they have this uh, rifle site called the uh, Maprolite Foresight which looks a little bit like a large red dot or holosite, uh, but it's uh, not. Well, it is a red dot, but it also has a screen projected up that can take a ton of data from integrated sensors, from the compass, from the level, from in the future from a shot counter, uh, some ballistic stuff, a bunch of other things. It can connect via Bluetooth to your smartphone. You can switch reticles. It's you know, sort of an interesting design. Where all this is going to go, I don't know yet, right? So a lot of the stuff I see looks to me a little bit half-baked. The Maprolite solution is actually not bad, but it seems like mar the market is kind of grasping for uh, uh, what will work along those same lines in uh, digital life is called augmented reality, and different people have different ideas on the subject. Okay. All right, so uh, moving on, I ran into a company called Black Diamond Optics out of Utah, I want to say, who seem to be new. They said they've been around for a couple of years, but this is their first time at shot. Uh, they claim they have European glass uh, built, assembled somewhere in Asia. They wouldn't say where exactly, so somebody doesn't tell you where they assemble it. My basic assumption is it's in China. They had three or four scopes, 
which to me honestly looked like compared to the conventional Chinese made scopes, which doesn't mean bad, right? A lot of really decent Chinese made scopes coming out now. Uh, these are the, the ones from Black Diamond that I saw, a fairly traditional MOA based uh, designs. Seemed okay, I didn't see anything truly unusual. They said that they do their own design in house optical design, mechanical design, and all that sort of stuff, which I find. A little bit odd, but you know I don't have enough information to call them on it. Um, I took a brochure. I'm gonna do some research and figure out what these guys do, who they are, and things like that. Black diamond optics. They're saying long range tactical rifle scope, and everything I saw in the booth is second focal plane, and MOA based. So yeah, I guess we have a different take on what uh, long range tactical scope is supposed to be. Now. Uh, and spent a few minutes in what's called a pop-up pavilion, it's today only, with a bunch of small, innovative, or small companies which haven't had any other chance to get to SHOT Show. One of them is a company called uh, Double Take. This is kind of a weird device they do. They're trying to reimagine a binocular. It's basically a box with a smartphone screen on the back, couple of apertures on the other side, one long focal length, one short focal length, so you sort of kind of get something like a zoom. The prototypes they had was just some recorded video, they were not really functioning yet. Um, might work okay, I don't know, I like these kind of things. Um, uh, having seen this stuff in the past, I think the final shape this will take is not what they were showing today. I think as they start testing this and doing more things, uh, this will change. But, you know, two image sensors, two different optical paths, stabilization, live sharing, 4K video, potential connectivity, and a lot of reach in a fairly compact platform. They're using some folded optics. That yeah, could work. That yeah, could be interesting. Also there in all those pop-up booths was a company that actually made some noise, something called Sensite. Another uh, company out of Israel with uh, two cameras, day camera and low light camera. And a really innovative display. Um, uh, there's, I'll post, I took some pictures basically, but basically this is what it basically looks like. They are talking about some interesting way of viewing the screen. To me, it looked like you are just looking at the screen, which is something I don't like. I prefer to have an eyepiece that projects a small screen out. Uh, these guys, it looked like you were just looking at the screen, so you're focused on something up close, right? When using a rifle scope, your eye should really be uh, adjusted for long distance observation, right? So you can seamlessly transition from looking through the scope to looking uh, and this a distance. However, these guys are doing something funky. I'll need to do some research and try to figure it out. So that was Sunside. Uh, the nice thing about it was they had nice touchscreen integration, touch a ton of functionalities, ballistics, reticles, slow light modes, bright modes. It's basically kind of like as if a smartphone company made a rifle scope. And it was surprisingly well integrated that uh, the user interface looked kind of mature. Um, in terms of the GUI, in terms of user interface, this was easily the most mature of all these strange digital rifle scope augmented reality things that uh, we saw. So definitely a company to watch. I'd like to see what they do. Uh, they have an office uh, in Pennsylvania, but the three guys I saw there were all Israelis. So I don't know. We'll see. Okay. So that was set site. Now, something I got a lot of questions on was uh, zero compromise optics. Uh, we did a video clip with them, we'll uh, uh, post it up later. Interesting company, new company, um, headed by uh, Jeff Huber and Robert Artwall, I think, who is a former head of Colors, something along those lines. And Jeff Huber was head of Colors USA, before that managed Night Force for uh, a number of years. So when these guys get together and start a new rifle school company, I sort of pay attention because it doesn't guarantee success per se, but they do know what it takes to uh, uh, bring in a, the right team to do a quality rifle scope. And they had two on display. One is in early production. The 
ZC527, so 5 to 27 by 56. Another one is not in production yet, that happens to be the one I'm interested in, the 4 to 20 by 50. Uh, production turrets, production eyepieces, production uh, mechanics, production optics. Uh, they definitely look a lot more mature than they did last year when they were such as showing some pre-production prototypes. It's very difficult to say inside the convention center how good a long-range rifle scope looks. There are a few things I can look at. I can basically look at flare because of all the strange light sources in there. But these look really decent. The turret feel was good. Everything moved and adjusted the right way. The reticles, I think, are well thought out. Two reticles, a three reticle, and a basic mill scale reticle. Nothing terribly exotic from a reticle standpoint but very functional. Uh, so this is kind of interesting, right? So lots of elevation, good image quality, likely good mechanics. I will have to try to get my hands on one of these through the year and test it. I mean, there is really no other way to tell, but I'm cautiously optimistic, let's put it that way. Let's see, uh, what else? Uh, March. So I went and visited March. Um, Despite some things I had to say about the latest product of theirs that I reviewed, they uh, did not seek the dogs on me, which speaks well to their maturity as a company. Uh, they had uh, three new things, a couple of them I knew about and a couple I didn't. So the one that everybody sort of knew about was the Genesis. They've been talking about it for a few months now. It looks like it's just about ready to go into production for the larger model. There will be two models. One is a 6 to 60 by 56, and a smaller one, which I saw for the first time, is a 4 to 40 by 52. I don't know how well you can see this. That's a larger one. That's a smaller one. Uh, Genesis is really interesting. Is a really interesting concept. It's sort of a new take on an externally adjusted rifle scope. So you have your optical system, the lenses are fixed in place, they're in some sort of a housing, and the adjustments are on outside of the housing. And it is really, the Genesis is really intended for ELI, extreme long range shooting. And what um, this scope does, it gives you, you know, it's a three, three or 400 MOA worth of uh, uh, adjustment, which I thought was, kind of impressive. Now, there is more true ELR than just adjustment range, so we'll see how these do. But the scopes are innovative, and you know, I have, there are some things that they do, I don't fully understand why. Um, but I, I like it when people do something innovative, so I've got no problem with it uh, uh, whatsoever. Another uh, new product that I did not know anything about is the new PRS target scope. PRS is for Precision Rifle Series, so apparently they are still trying to make scope for the PRS. It's front focal plane, 5 to 42 by 56 with a high master optical system. To them, high master is basically you know, the latest and greatest version of optical design. New eyepiece, so the field, effective field of view is 26 degrees instead of 20, so it's a wider field of view system. It looked pretty easy to get behind. It had, the, excuse me, had their uh, tree reticle, which is quite good. A nice turrets, zero stop, elimination, all the usual March stuff. One thing I found really interesting is that March was talking about uh, their design being more thermally stable. I didn't know anybody was complaining. It turns out the field target people have been complaining that March scopes shift a lot, the focus shifts a lot with temperature, which sort of makes sense. They tend to use comparatively short focal length systems that would be more temperature sensitive. Well, March, to their great credit, is paying attention and they're athermalizing their designs. I don't think it's gone through everything, but these new scopes, uh, they're specifically saying that they paid attention to uh, thermal drift. So that's kind of interesting. So that was good to see. Uh, March always makes nice catalogs. I always pick one up. Okay. All right, let's see. I have a few notes here and a few business cards. So I'm going to, I'm going through this in no particular order. So you know, keep that in mind. Let's see, uh, let's talk about MTC. Daystate and Brockhawk. MTC is an optics company, Daystate and Brockhawk are two sister companies that make uh, 
really interesting looking uh, air rifles. So the gentleman who runs the optics branch of MTC uh, in the US is a Brad Bonar, who I've known for a while. He's worked for another company. Um, I've been using the Viper Connect rifle scope on my air gun for two years now, and I like it a lot. That's that very short eye relief rifle scope, uh, which uh, you need since uh, you, uh, you don't need eye relief on an air gun. Basically, and you can take advantages of a short eye relief with a wide, brilliant field of view and all that. This year, MTC has a their first ever uh, front focal plane uh, scope which is kind of interesting. I think they're calling it um, Cobra F1. It's a 4 to 16 by 50. MTC always has interesting radicals, and this one is not bad at all. Um, should be in production mid-year. If I have an appropriate comparison, I'll get my hands on one. I, you know, kind of decent, right? It's a turret felt decent, uh, basic optical quality looked okay, reticle is intelligent, close focus down to 10 meters. So for air gunners and uh, uh, rim fire shooters, it will work just fine. And I kind of like it. It's uh, not a bad thing at all. And uh, we uh, shot a fairly long video with talking about air guns with that nice lady, the world champion field target lady whose name I shamefully forgot. Shame on me. What was her name? I'll pull it up later with anyhow. A hmm? With a J? Mm, I don't think so. Don't remember. No, I used to remember things that my kids were born and I haven't had a full night of sleep for seven years and this is what happens. I blame my children. And yeah, smart enough not to blame my wife. Okay, but anyhow, so I'll stand over there trying to figure out her name. I'll fill that in later if it comes to that. But she gave, we did a long video with her. She explained a lot about the rifles she uses in competition and another one that another sponsored shooter uses and a little bit more something slightly more affordable but still very high quality. One of the Brokok air guns that I found really really interesting and I'll post pictures and everything later has the, uses the furniture from an AR-15 and one of the things I shoot air guns a lot these days. Lauren Parsons. Lauren Parsons, that's the nice lady who spent all that time with us. Extremely knowledgeable and uh, one of the things that's rare, right, there are a lot of knowledgeable people in this industry, there are not that many who can really articulate that knowledge well, and she could, and I was very impressed. Uh, I'm in gonna... 2018, she was second place world champion. Uh, but first place ladies. Okay. But anyhow, thank you, Lauren. It was extremely educational. I'm just sort of getting into air guns, partly because it's an expensive way to shoot, partly because they're very accurate. And partly because they just look cool. Anyhow, so Brokok has an air gun that uses a grip and stock uh, from an AR-15. So one project that I might explore this year, if I can get my hands on it, I think they're very, having a very hard time keeping it in stock, is getting one, uh, setting it up with the scope, with this reticle and everything similar to what I use on an AR, and see if I can use it as a trainer. Right? It's an inexpensive way to train, and these things are accurate, right? Uh, according to Lauren, with her match gun, she, with that little 22 caliber pallet, she's holding one of my groups at 100 yards. Freaking air gun. That's just impressive. And don't tell me about all the quarter-inch groups that everybody shoots, right? Okay, I'm not going to go on that tangent. Not today. But anyhow, so that's MTC, Day State, and Brockhawk. I like them. Pleasant people. Um, it was a nice conversation. Then we went over and talked to Hawk. I haven't looked at Hawk scopes for a couple of years. The last one I looked at was the Frontier 1 to 6, which I liked immensely. It was a really good scope. Uh, for 800 bucks, it was just awesome. So it appears that they have redesigned the Frontier and Sidewinder line with some front focal plane scopes again and have uh, some new Frontier binoculars in, in the three to four hundred dollar range that looked very respectable. Now with the Frontier, there are front focal plane scopes that look interesting. The optics look already designed, the turrets are a little bit different. Uh, the reticles are pretty decent and they are well priced. So I think I should be looking at Hawk Frontier as competition to Athlon, Ares, BTR and some other uh, scopes out there coming out. 
like the, these are sort of a new crop of mid-range Chinese made scopes that are very very far cry from Chinese made scopes from just four or five years ago they are really respectable I've been looking at some of them from different makers for a little bit now they're holding up well they adjust well optical quality is decent and I've seen a few samples here and there and they look reasonably consistent so look for a hawk review at some point during this year comparing to Athlon or something else along those lines speaking of Athlon I did swing by the guys at Athlon I like them uh, they push the envelope I have a lot of appreciation for that a lot of things that we've been talking about for the last year or two are now uh, getting into production and looking really respectable the first to mention I think is the Kronos of FFP spotter, it's kind of like a Bushnell LMSS 7 by 242 by 60 with a reticle. I, you know, a couple of years ago when I started looking at this, I helped them a little bit with the reticle. Uh, so I've been playing a little bit with one of the prototypes and I've been pretty happy with it. It's been robust and reliable. Well, I looked at the product now production uh, spotters they've got there, and they are looking a little bit better. Some distortion I see with my prototype at the edges has been fixed. My best guess is through better centering and assembly. So I'm going to switch over to the production one and beat it up a little more. Uh, I think it's a great field scope because at low power you can use it and support it. You can use it uh, with just a little more power off of a backpack and you can still hook it up on uh, to a tripod and use it like a more conventional spotter. I, I, I kind of like it. Uh, there are the new Kronos binoculars. Uh, couple stand out one was a high power 15 by 56 binocular for about i think six seven hundred bucks comes with the hard case and all that sort of jazz there is very little i can tell about the 15 power binocular on the lower floor of the sands expo convention center it looked respectable binocular in uh, this magnification range is not strictly speaking my cup of tea um, this is for you know open space hunters who do a lot of glassing so, so I may or may not look at this one I really don't know if I have something to compare it to maybe but uh, it looked decent I'm gonna look for other people who go you know accuse deer hunting or something like that to look at it and then decide what I probably am going to look into is on also Kronos uh, wrench finding binocular it's a 10 by 50 uh, reasonable price, I think the six seven hundred dollar range as well. I think don't quote me on it. I need to look it up. It's a you know, it's a comparatively simple device which sort of appeals to me. There are no ballistic computers, calculators, and all that, which I really don't mind. Just a very respectable ten to fifty binocular with a built-in laser rangefinder that works out to on a human type target 7-800 yards, something like that. Nothing ultra fancy, but uh, the optics look good, everything was well aligned um, for the multiple targets inside. It was fairly repeatable, it looked like the beam's pretty tight. I think I'll look at that. I don't look at laser range finders too much, I do once in a blue moon. I think I'm gonna look at this one and maybe uh, a couple more that uh, uh, came out this year. And what was it? And lastly, there was a Midas 8 power ultra compact binocular. Mm -hmm. I don't really see any development happening with this binocular type, which is a shame. I kind of like these. I see a lot of people have one in their range bag, you know, to look at the target from 50 yards, something like that. All right, so that's Athlon. What else? Uh, Kestrel has some sort of a heads up attachment. You hook it up to a rifle. It reads whatever your wind meter has uh, measured so you can see it to the side of the rifle without taking your eyes off too much, without moving your head and all that. That looked kind of interesting. And on the other side of the equation, I had a really, really tiny anemometer, the little wind meter, a smaller, simpler version of what they make, which I think, compared to an expensive, which I think will do well overall. Really tiny, really easy to have with you. That I think that's a move in the right direction. Too many things we make now are bigger than they should be, more complicated than they should be. I have some sort of romantic appreciation toward going back to somewhat simpler uh, devices. 
Let's see, uh, Vortex. All right, so Vortex is always a long visit. There's a lot to talk about. I've known these guys forever and a day, and they make a ton of stuff. And they make a ton of stuff, they make a lot of changes, and uh, we have discussions about a lot of potentially upcoming things that I was uh, politely asked not to talk about, since Vortex probably has enough disposable income to send the Predator drone after me, I'm not going to talk about that. That having been said, um, they are changing a little bit how they introduce products in the past. I would just show a bunch of uh, up and coming stuff at SHOT Show and then proceed to listen to people rant and rave that's not yet available for the next several months. They decided that they've had enough of that particular type of masochism. And now if they, uh, if they introduce something at SHOT Show, that means that when the dealers who you know, visit them go back home, they can go and place an order. Okay? So there isn't that much new coming out SHOT Show, but I have some insight and several things I'll be introducing through the year. And I think this is going to be a good year for Vortex. Um, they are probably the largest player in the sporting optics world right now, and it's really nice to see that they're still really paying attention uh, uh, to their customers. It's, it's a good thing there. It looks like they're building a lot of things that we've been asking for for a little while, I think, and they're coming. Of the things that they did show, uh, most of it has been out already. A couple of things that are uh, important for the Vortex Razor rifle scope. There is now a fixed power, I think 22 power eyepiece for the 85 millimeter Razor. Uh, there are Diamondback tactical scopes, which I think they're doing extremely well with. And the basic advantage is that these are budget scopes with a sophisticated reticle. Same one you would be using in your larger razor. Rifle scopes, great trainer scopes. I've been beating one up for a little while now. It's perfectly robust. I'm really happy with it. Uh, razor rifle scopes, Razor Gen 2s are getting a little cheaper, so they are going to compete in that $1,500 uh, to $2,000 price range. Um, still nice scopes, always have been, so it's going to be interesting now that they're a little bit more, uh, uh, a little bit more affordable. And uh, they have a new range finding binocular that, according to Vortex, can range reflective objects, things like 5,000 yards or something, and non-reflective, like human, a couple of thousand yards. Um, once again, this is not the type of product I pay huge amount of attention to, but that kind of got my interest perked, so maybe I'll do some sort of a comparison with those. We shall see. All right, and what, anything else in Vortex that I can talk about without getting myself plastered by an IED? No, okay. That should do it. Just to be clear, I was there for almost two hours, and this is all I can tell you, so you know, make your conclusions. But they're making cool stuff that's coming. Uh, Bishop, ammunition, and guns. So there are two nice ladies who used to serve in the army and uh, somehow have a gun and ammunition business out in California, and uh, presumably not far from Bishop somewhere. Actually, no, they're in Northern California, near Sacramento. Bishop is the last name of one of them. So I ran into them last year, and they kind of have a really interesting take on firearm design. Something along the lines of, I am going to make what I think I'm going to want to make. It looks cool to me. If you don't like it, go take a long walk and a short beer. I have a lot of appreciation for that. Uh, these are kind of, they're making cartridges and guns where most people go, ah, I think that's enough. And I go, no, 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 it's going to be bigger and harder and harder hitting, right? They are doing a ton of really interesting stuff with 458 Sokol, which I have a soft spot for since I have an AR in the chamber for uh, 458 Sokol. They have a freaking lever gun chambered for 458 Sokol where they redesigned the bolt gun. It's a controlled feed Marlin based lever gun that the only thing it shares with Marlin is the name, I think. Because Marlin, in its current iteration, is owned by Remington, is basically an unapologetic piece of manure. Uh, and what they do with it makes it a really nice firearm. It shoots for 58 Sokol. Reliably, apparently. Right? So that, 
got a lot of appreciation for that. But apparently 458 Socom is not big enough. So they came up with this cartridge that's called, I, I wrote it down, 475 Bishop Short Magnum, which sort of translates to yikes. They shoved this bloody thing into an AR-10, well, LR-3 DPMS pattern, uh, large uh, frame AR, uh, and said, yeah, it's 12 pounds, a 12 pound for a reason, you don't want it lighter. I'm like, yeah, probably not. It's a 475 caliber uh, solid copper bullet that I think it's like 350, 400 grain at 2500 foot per second. Basically, it's a 5000 foot pound energy gun. So, if you like want to take down a T Rex, that would be a good option. Maybe a little overkill, but okay. And for those who don't want to do it in a semi auto, meaning don't want to absorb some of the recoil on cycling the action and on the gas system, they make it in a, a bolt action. For the bolt action uh, a rifle, they use their own bench rest action, which is, looks really nice and comparatively affordable. I told them they should go talk to PRS shooters. Uh, that weighs, I think, about 10 11 pounds, and they've got two mercury recoil reducers uh, in uh, stock to make it. Uh, so that when you fire a shot and dislocate your shoulder, it wouldn't rip it off, so the next shot you can relocate it, you know, something along those lines. Uh, but all jokes aside, I like the stuff they're building because when you hold it, it's heavy, but it's balanced in the right place. And most people who try to go bigger, 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 really don't focus too much on getting their guns uh, properly balanced. And I, well, I like that, that was pretty cool. All right, that's uh, Bishop. I like them. They have some sort of a, a scope line that they're planning to introduce. They're not pushing it too much. I think they're changing OEMs or something. So I mostly looked at the gun-related things. Somewhere around the corner from there was a company called Full Conceal Inc. I will post some pictures. I think we took some pictures. I don't have anything here right now. So imagine a perfectly good Glock. Imagine a person with too much time on his hand and a hacksaw getting his hands on a perfectly good Glock. So they basically cut off the handle and re and the uh, guard, finger trigger. guard, fin trigger guard, right? And then uh, remachine and reattach them in some sort of strategic fashion so that basically if you imagine a gun, it folds like this becomes flat, so it can fire, you can shove it in your pocket, then you just open it and it's loaded and ready to rock. Person, I think it's a solution looking for a problem. Uh, but you gotta give them an A plus for ingenuity. I mean, this is pretty cool. And they did this with the Glock 43, with the Glock 17. And when I stopped cringing from looking at the cut up freaking Glock, I mean, I kind of have to appreciate the ingenuity. The lock-up is real solid when it's reattached. It's, uh, it was kind of interesting. All right, so that was Full Conceal Inc. Uh, next on uh, uh, my list was Tail Hook from Gearhead Works. Uh, what a tail hook is, is uh, we've all seen these kind of a rubberized... Uh, uh, forearm uh, stabilizer systems, right, that we never put to our shoulders and all that. So imagine a good mechanical engineer got his hand on that thing and said, ah, oh, this is a flimsy piece of excrement. We can make it better. Well, that's what basically tail hook is. They redesigned this whole thing, made it out of metal, made it usable. Unlike the original, you can actually use it as a forearm stabilizer system. Uh, they had some really nice guns sitting there, various uh, bolt action pistols and AR pistols and all that. Kind of liked it. Um, I think that's a good interpretation uh, of the problem. Right. As we were rushing to our uh, next visit, we ran into a company called <coughs> Field Optics Research, and there we met Kyle. What can I tell you about Kyle? Kyle does pull-ups on a four-pound carbon fiber tripod. 
We, we took a video of it, we will post it, you, you'll see it. But what really uh, got my attention, once again, you'll see it in the video, is that they're kind of approaching this in an innovative manner. And the setup I saw is probably half the, pli uh, half the price of RRS. Is it as good? I don't know. It looked good to me. I think it was well made. It looked to be well priced. Um, the guys know what they're doing. They're enthusiasts, they're hunters. It's worth looking into. I'm going to try to look at one of their leveling heads and see uh, how well it works. Okay, let's see. And uh, oh, yeah, almost forgot. Then we went and spent some time with Burris and Steiner. So what we saw at Steiner was officially the coolest thing we saw at the shot that I can tell you about. Uh, these guys uh, have managed to fuse a red dot sight with a thermal rifle scope. So basically have an overlay of an image from a thermal camera with a red dot sight. So for low light situation, CQB and all that, I think that will kick ass. I had two of them there, I think they're very close to production. It's not going to be cheap, probably a few grand. Uh, I'll figure out the exact pricing and I'll figure out how I can get one for um, <coughs> extended t and &E. uh, I think there is a, a pig in Texas with its name on it. The site is called uh, CQT. And this is what it looks like. Uh, really interesting, I'll talk more about it. Uh, somewhere a decade or a little more of a, than a decade ago, I worked for one of the large defense contractors on fused weapon sites for the military, uh, which were tens of thousands of dollars at the time. And you know, any consumer caught with it would be shot in sight. And now I think this is going to hit the market, be consumer ready. This is really cool. I was really, 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 really impressed. Aside from that, with Steiner, so I finally was able to see their. M8, the 128x24 uh, rifle scope. Unfortunately, the one that saw was a second focal plane. That was originally supposed to be FFP, but something went awry. I hope they'll go back to that. It looked well made. I think the turret's a little too big for that scope. And honestly, what, <clears throat> with the 1 to 8, I really prefer front focal plane designs. The M7, 4 to 28 by 56 rifle scope, looked really good. So there was the standard version and the one with IFS, the integrated firing solution. Both looked very respectable. Uh, one of them had the uh, Gen 2 MSR reticle, which I like. The IFS um, has a screen projected to the top third of the field of view that gives you all sorts of useful data that can be piped in from an external device, like a laser edge finder or something like that. And it also tracks what's happening with the turrets. It tells you how many clicks away from the firing solution you are and a bunch of other things. Um, I thought it was pretty well done, to be honest with you. I am not real gadget with stuff like this. I think we overdo it, but this is not bad. It's right there, right in the scope. You can see it. Uh, I think that was useful. Uh, looked at the R1X uh, red dot site, but I've already seen it when I visited Burris, which looked very respectable. And two new Steiner Prism sites, 432 and 332. Looked to be good optics, good field of view. <clears throat> Excuse me, possibly something for me to look at. Walking over to the Burris side, I didn't spend enough time that I had another meeting to run to, uh, but the XTR3 scopes are looking excellent. Uh, what they had, they were basically production scopes and they looked quite good. I think these will cause some problems for a lot of people in the $1,500, $1,600 range. Um, that's at the top of my list of scopes to test. Uh, through 2019. Let's see, uh, what else? No idea who these people are, no idea who these people are. Don't know, don't know, don't know. All right, last but not least, Miopta. So I can tell you less about what Miopta is planning than I can tell you about what Vortex is planning, but I spent about as much time at Miopta as I did at Vortex. Miopta is a new company. Uh, they hired a couple of key people for the Miopta US. They look to have the support of the owners of Miopta. Miopta is a Czech company, but the owners are American. They live in New York. Uh, Miopta USA is in Tampa, Florida. So two manufacturing facilities, Czech Republic and US. 
All of the current sporting optics from Miopta are made in the Czech Republic, including the new Optica 6 product line, which is a couple of binoculars and several rifle scopes. Uh, rifle scopes are priced in the $400 to $900 range, I think. And the binocular is 300 bucks. It's 300 bucks for a Czech made, European made binocular, it, which looked quite respectable. I think Miopta is basically planning to put a lot of pricing pressure on competition. Optimechanical, their products have always been good. Uh, they just need a little bit more direction from a product design standpoint. And they, it looks like they are getting it now. So I'm very bullish on the future of Miopta in the next uh, uh, year or two. I'll talk more about Optica 6 scopes as we go along. It's a good lineup of uh, second focal plane and front focal plane uh, scopes. Uh, they looked very solid and they looked to be exceedingly good for the money. Um, more, all of them are 30 millimeter tube scopes with 6x uh, erectors, except for 5 to 30 by 56, which is a front focal plane for 34 millimeter tube scope with a nice exposed turret, uh, zero stop. And an option of their um, what is dichroic reticle. So they came up with some sort of thin film device that can be deposited on a reticle cell and make a reticle that is red during the day and greenish during at night. If there's any light at all, the reticle shows up. Any light at all means if you see an image, you see also see the reticle. Uh, there is a patent on there. I think I understand how they're doing. I will swing by again tomorrow. One of the technical guys is uh, supposed to be there because the gentleman I talked to, he was very nice, well, very helpful, quite knowledgeable. And when I started digging deep, I think I made him very nervous. I'm going to go talk to the engineer. This reticle technology is extremely promising. And what I like immensely is that they can combine it with a conventional edged reticle. So now that gives you a really, really broad range of putting in very sophisticated reticle features, which will keep you running during the day or during the night and without necessarily an aid of batteries. Right? I think this is a very interesting uh, development and expect to hear a lot more from me about Miopta. This is going to be one of the brands I really pay close attention and focus on as uh, uh, the year continues. I was uh, extremely encouraged with what I saw at Miopta. All in all, for me, this was it's shaping up to be a very entertaining year between the Burris and Vortex and Miopta, a few other things that are happening. I think the competition is really, is really heating up. Anyhow, uh, unless something else comes to me now, I think that's a wrap. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching. I really appreciate your time.